Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2,164 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Today we continue our extended series of messages that I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past couple of years. This message is week 31 of a 43-week series about the good news according to John the Apostle. John has a unique style and narrative as we walk with him through the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. Today, we're going to continue our series on the good news according to John the Apostle. I've started that out at this is many weeks since we've been going through this series, almost the entire year. I hope you're enjoying it and learning from it as much as I am. We'll probably finish up this toward the end of November, first part of December, the book of John. But until then, we'll continue through these chapters. Last week, we saw Jesus taught us through an allegory. And the allegory was between the vine and the branches. And the emphasis was on bearing fruit by staying attached to that main vine so that we can receive the nourishment of the Holy Spirit. And to do this, we must remain in Christ, as we read in chapter 15, verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And then our scripture today is John chapter 15, verses 12 through 17, as we continue on starting on page 1677 of our Pew Bible. Jesus gives us command that we should love each other. So follow along as I read, starting with verse 12. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay one's life down for one's friend. If you are my friend, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant doesn't know what is his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my father's name, in the name of my father, he will give you. This is my command, love one another. Told Paul as we were walking out the door today, I sort of felt naked, didn't have any props with me today, any object lessons. But I'm building that into the lesson today, and hopefully you'll see that. I thought about bringing in a tree as part of the object lesson today, but I decided to just put it in our bulletin insert. So let me start today with a story, a story about Samuel Taylor Coolridge. He was a lonely genius. He was born of aging parents in Devonshire, England. He was the youngest of 10 kids, and he did not receive the love that most children are given, and therefore he never had the opportunity to grow real close relationships with other people. His father died before his 10th birthday, and after that he was sent to boarding school, a school that was notorious for their harsh treatment of their students. And then he went to live with various family members. Nevertheless, his caretakers did recognize his exceptional intellect, and they enrolled him in Cambridge University, where he quickly distinguished himself as a, as a scholar. Now, Coleridge made, was made known for three notable habits. He was a voracious reader. He was a prolific writer. And he was known for his radical thinking. I think the demos are trying to figure out where each one of them is going. <laughs> Eventually, his philosophical, per, philosophical pursuits led him away from his father's faith and away from its Cambridge University before his graduation. After that, he accumulated a large debt. He pursued French philosophy. He attempted to find, uh, found a utopian society in the western hills of Pennsylvania. He married and then divorced. He became hopelessly addicted to opium. Come on in, John. (laughs) They're going around. (laughs) And after his addiction to opium, he eventually managed to estrange himself from his family and friends. He then met 
a man by the name of William Wordsworth, who befriended this ruthless genius. And that led to some of the most productive period of writing and publishing, during which he wrote such poems as Remorse, Love, Kubla Khan, and his most famous work, The Rhyme of an Ancient Mariner. The main character in this poem was a, an emotional autobiography as he laments, alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on that wide, wide sea, and never a saint took pity on my soul in agony. Now, eventually, Wordsworth discontinued his relationship with Coolridge, who had become so excessively dependent on opium that he could no longer handle him. Coolridge separated from his second wife. He abandoned his children and could no longer sustain a meaningful workload. After that, he moved in with a home, in a home of a pharmacist named James Gilman, hoping to reduce his dosage of opium, but it quickly became a second source for him. Nevertheless, Gilman allowed Coolreach to remain in his home with his family for the rest of his natural life. And a few years before his death, Coleridge acknowledged the value of that soul friend in his poem, Youth and Age, which includes this line, friendship is like a sheltering tree. At times, it appears that our lives are like that. We try to get or to make ourselves more than we are. We think we can do it without close friends and family. And I think this is especially true of young men. We try to prove ourselves that we are, to the world, self-made men. We fail to realize that we are stronger together than we are alone. The wisest man who ever lived, King Solomon, wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. How can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two standing back to back can conquer. Three are even better. A triple braided cord is not easily broken. I was not unlike most young men thinking that I could do everything myself. I think I still have some of those tendencies that I have to fight against. But I've grown in wisdom. I see that Jesus, the most capable and mature man who ever lived, sought out the companionship of 12 friends. And within that 12, he became even closer with three, Peter, James, and John. Then on the eve of his crucifixion, as they retreated to the seclusion of that upper room, with those 12, he shared his wisdom. He drew comfort from them, and he received support. During his discourse on how the disciples and subsequent generations of the disciples, he taught us how we should conduct ourselves after his departure. The Lord highlighted the importance of close friends. These sheltering trees spread the protection of four branches. And if you look in your bulletin insert, the side with the tree on it and four large branches, this is, reminds me of a tree that we saw in Williams, Williamstown, Williamsburg. Williamsburg, they have this huge tree with these limbs hanging down. This is what it reminded me of. And this was in Coleridge's poem, The Sheltering Tree. Friendship is like that sheltering tree. And today we want to look at four of those branches. A disregard for personal sacrifice in verse 13. The second branch is a dedication to mutual aims in verse 14. The third branch is a mutual confidentiality in verse 15. And the fourth branch is a shared desire for success in verse 16. This is the sheltering tree that we can have with that close friendship with others. Now we back up to verse 12, though. The commandments Jesus referenced here was the same command that was in verse 10 when he said, obey my commands. And they're embodied in this new one, this new command. He commanded believers to love one another. Verse 12, it says, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Now, in the worldly sense of the term, the command sounds impossible to accomplish. And it overwhelms us at times. How can we possibly love someone we don't really intimately know or have 
any type of close feelings for. Now, the world's concept of love is self-oriented. It's a performance-based love, a fickle sentiment that we might have for someone. It's a conditional love. I'll love you if you do such and such, or if you love me. People fail, fall in and out of love through some sort of random, mysterious force that affects the two minds for a season, but may fade just as quickly at the same time. And this is not the type of love that Jesus is talking about here, that Jesus is commanding us to have, that he's referring to. One thing is important to remember, love is always a choice. It's always a decision we make to love. One that we must make every single day. Now the Greek word in this passage is not eros, that fickle love that drives on our passions. It's not even that heartfelt love that we might have for a, a friend, that philia love. But it's an agape love. In Jesus' day, agape love was a new kind of love. Agape often involves a deep feeling but it also begins with a decision that we choose to love someone. Agape doesn't consider merit and doesn't wait for inspiration to hit. It doesn't wait for us to get old goo goo gaga over someone. It is a love that we choose to love someone else regardless of who they are or what they've done. Agape love is a kind of love exemplified by God, especially in his relationship with Jesus Christ. His son, that was the love that Jesus was commanding us to have here. Moreover, in this verse, we don't see it in our English, but in the Greek, it's an imperfect tense, this, this verb. It suggests repeating our ongoing action. It says, keep on loving. It's not a one-time thing. We are to keep on loving always. It's the quality of the love that must be the same kind that we receive from Jesus Christ. Christ is our example, and he is our standard for love. The Lord then describes the four, love in four practical terms, and these are the four trees of our, our, our four limbs of our sheltering tree. By giving these examples listed in the bulletin, he follows these four examples with a closing bookend in John 15, 17. This is my command, love each other. But how do we love each other? And those are the four limbs we want to look at. Verse 13 is a disregard for personal sacrifice. While this verse has a view of Jesus acting on our behalf and dying for all humanity, his sacrifice illustrates this important principle. The ultimate example of love for one another is our willingness to prioritize another person's life over our own life. Charles Dickens incorporated this concept in his novel, The Tale of Two Cities, whose characters were caught up in the swirling insanity, insanity and ra rampant bloodshed of that French, French Revolution. In the final scene, a selfless loyal lawyer, Sidney Carton, took the place of his friend who he was defending, and he took his place on the guillotine in order to secure freedom for his friend. Onlookers recalled Carton's serene expression as he climbed the steps of the scaffolding up to that guillotine, saying, in effect, it is a far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is a far, far better rest than I go to now than I have ever known. The ultimate sacrifice is that expression of love we have for someone else. Now, we're unlikely to be forced to make a choice between our life and the life of someone else. Fortunately, we live in a country where freedom is still pretty strong in our, our country. And we have the freedom to choose. We have a freedom that we don't have to lay our life down for one of our loved ones or friends. More often, we're asked to give up those small, everyday measures day by day rather than one grand gesture of giving up our life. And in many ways, that's even more difficult because every day we have to sacrifice a little bit, a little bit, a little bit for those that we love. For example, love for a friend doesn't keep a record of sacrifice. This kind of love values the other person more than we value our own self. 
So the sacrifice becomes a matter of a minor significance. As Sarah read the, the passage in 1 Corinthians of love, that great love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hope, hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. And that's our first branch in this sheltering tree. The second branch in verse 14 is the dedication to mutual aims. The statement involves a condition. If we do as Jesus commanded, we are identified as Jesus' friend. And we're, we're recipients of his sacrifice. This does not suggest that we'll obey perfectly every time or every moment. After all, we're not capable of being morally perfect and obeying perfectly. Instead, it speaks of our intent to pursue Jesus' aims as his followers to follow his instructions. The soldier on the battlefield supports a mission by following the orders of his commander. He may die before he finishes that mission, but if he's following his orders, he's completing his mission. But if he deliberately disobeys, he underlines, undermines that mission that may never then be accomplished. And so with, it is with us. We are Jesus' friends when we support his aim. And his aim here is to love one another. Which takes us to the third branch of the sheltering tree, mutual confidentiality in verse 15. The use of philos means friend or comrade. And this term was unusual for Jesus to be speaking because it's usually concerning Jesus who is usually addressed as Lord or Master or Rabbi or my God. Phelos in this con content suggests a peer relationship, one that we're nearly equals with him. However, it certainly does not claim that we are pure like Christ, but we eventually, when we will see him face to face, we will be, know him like he is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But when we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. So he's elevating us to a status of friendship. No longer is he the master and we're the pupils. No longer is he the rabbi and we have to sit at his feet. He's raising us to a level, elevating us to a higher standard, a higher standard than what we really deserve. Nevertheless, his superiority is never compromised in this. He does not come down to our level, but he raises us up to his level. As a practical example, our oldest son, Buddy, when he was very young, he enjoyed the company of older people much more than he did the company of his peers. When we'd be in conversations with adults, he'd be right there, entering his bits of wisdom also. I think he felt like he was his equal, our equal at times. His reading, his verbal and comprehension skills were well beyond his years, well beyond my years at times. But in certain areas of life, it was evident that he was not one of our peers. When we got into a car to go somewhere, he was not a peer with us at that point. For instance, he did not have a driver's license, and his feet could not even reach the so he did not, was not on the same level as we were the, at that point. Now that our children are grown, they've changed in status in our lives. We're no longer parenting them in the sense as when they were young. They are now more our peers and our friends. And so it is with Christ as we Put our faith in him as we follow his commands. He has elevated us to be a friend of his, a peer with him. And so it is. When we become a friend with Christ, he shares with us the details 
of his redemptive plan to, for the world, and he calls us to stand beside him in accomplishing his goals and his aims. And what was his aims, his goals, as he came to earth was to build God's kingdom, to establish his kingdom on earth, and then to leave it to us to continue building until he returns to reestablish that global Eden, to rule and reign for all eternity. And that's where Christ was elevating us as he did with his disciples. Through the indwelling Holy Spirit, the Son of God allows us to complete access to the mind of Christ. It says in Scripture that we either have the same mind that Jesus Christ had. He shares with us through the Holy Spirit his deepest thoughts, his deepest plans for this world. He brings us into fellowship with the Trinity, even though we're not morally perfect and won't be until we see him face to face. We do not possess those divine attributes of omnipotence or omniscience yet. He treats us, though, like equals, even though we haven't fully attained that status yet. Genuine friendship between a husband and a wife are not founded upon superficiality or should not be. Intimacy that a husband and wife should ha have or very close friends that you might have in your lives affords little room for secrets. Friends share every detail of their lives regardless of how embarrassing or scandalous they are. Because they provide us with an opportunity for recovery, for healing, and for growing in that friendship. The almighty creator of the universe invited us to relate with him as his friend, to enjoy peer status of the very hands that created us, to be peers, to be friends with him. And that fourth limb that we'll look at of that sheltering tree is a shared desire for success. The verse makes it clear that our relationship with the Lord calls us to share and share reciprocally. Share with one with another as the Lord shares with us. Believers are cho chosen and appointed for the purpose of obedience. And the outcropping of obedience is producing fruit that we saw in last week's lesson. His command for us is to love one another. He loves us to join him in building his kingdom, building the kingdom of God. That's what our duties are as citizens of God's kingdom today. And as we obey, we're transformed in our spirit. We begin to think like the mind of Christ and to pray in a way to accomplish God's purpose in our life. That's when he says, you pray that the Lord will give you anything you pray because we're praying in the same mind as Christ would pray to his Father. We experience that growing one with, oneness with God in mind and in purpose. And then we come to verse 17, that outer bracket of today's passage. The Lord command, concluding commands not only brackets us in his teaching on love, love in the kingdom, but it also introduces us to a new concept, which we'll go into next week. Jesus begins to decide, describe the contrast between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. One, the kingdom of God is characterized by love, obedience, unity, and grace. On the other hand, the kingdom of this world shows forth hatred and selfishness, rejection and persecution. As we study that passage next week, the importance is grounded in our love for one another. If we never have this proper love for one another, it won't be apparent that we're shining lights in the darkness. And this is what we're to be. The love relationship that characterizes the oneness of the Trinity is the same kind of love that the Lord desires for his own. Furthermore, loving one another allows us to receive the love of God as we should. But the opposite is also true. We cannot know the love of God if we do not love people that he sent to be saved. 1 John 3.10 tells us, So now I can tell you are there all the children of God, and who are the ch so now I can tell who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not love does not belong to God. So if we're to show forth Christ, we must have love for one another. Failing to love one another makes us like the world which is characterized by hate. Jesus leaves us no middle ground, love or hate. And we must choose 
one or the other. And if you'll flip over your bulletin insert on the other side, we have our application, which is just a reiteration of what we've gone over. Let's go into it a little bit, a different aspect. By the end of his life, Samuel Taylor Coolidge entertained a steady stream of admirers who would come and see him because he was so intellectual and he was so thorough in his philosophies that many people came to see him. But as the years went on, the years of addiction to opium left him with only one genuine friend, and that was James Gilman. And he became Coolidge's sheltering tree. And as we noted above, we learned from the Lord's discussion on love that a sheltering friend spreads its branches over those that they love, like the sheltering tree that Coolidge wrote about. And those four, as we went over, those four branches, a disregard for personal sacrifice. To sacrifice means to forfeit something without expectation of anything in return. The sole motivation for sacrifice must be the highest and greatest good of the other person and not yourself. Therefore, do not sacrifice anything that you're unwilling to lose. Do not sacrifice anything unless you're willing to receive nothing in return and are willing to expect not even being recognized for that. After all, grace probably isn't grace until you have ability to lose that grace. If you're unwilling to sacrifice your hard feelings, without hard feelings, it's better to offer a minor point of kindness or mercy to others, and admit that you're not, not close enough as a friend, not deep enough for me to go with that ultimate sacrifice. Sacrifice is that dedication to personal sacrifice. The second limb was dedication to mutual aims. Genuine friendships are founded upon shared values. We don't have to be exactly the same. Individual goals might differ between two friends, However, the objection, objectives should not conflict, and ultimately they should honor the same principles. As an example, Paul and I have two distinct personalities. We're quite different in many ways. We have different strengths, we have different weaknesses. I'm a morning person, I'm up at five o'clock. Paula is a night person. She gets up when she gets up. But she also stays up much later than I could ever stay up. Paula likes to verbally process her thoughts. I internally process my thoughts. Paula is very detailed focus. She can find down to the last penny in a set of books that I'm a more of a big picture. Uh, close enough. But our values and aims of what really matter in life are closely aligned. We're both very frugal financially. We had similar upbringings and focuses in our lives growing up as for life living for God that were ingrained by our parents. And our dedication and mutual purposes in life, this, we pursue the same goals. And those goals are to live godly lives, to impact the world for the kingdom of God a dedication to a mutual purpose. But we don't have to be exactly the same to do so. We can share in each other's differences as we share within our ultimate aim and purpose in the end. We do support one another. The third branch is mutual confidentiality. Holding the confidence of another involves bringing up or keeping private matters absolutely with discretion. We don't go sharing private matters with everybody else between two close friends. Moreover, sharing a confidence requires complete honesty between friends. And when it boils down to it, you can only trust a very few people intimately in your life with sorting through your counsels or your plans to depending upon them to give their honest thoughts, especially when they disagree with you. Most difficult of all 
is to consider their advice when you're completely convinced that you are right. Let me restate it in another way, because it's crucial. Most significant test of true friendship is when you're willing to heed the counsel of someone else, even though you appear to be fully convinced yourself. If they tell you your specific course of action is unwise or unjust, you need to consider that approach, regardless of how convinced you are yourself. And I don't mean to say that every decision is made by majority rule or committee, because sometimes the Lord has laid on your heart a specific task that you need to do, and others might not see it. But for the most part, we would do well to heed godly counsel from our trusted friends, those friends that will steer us around our blind spots because we know that they are our genuine friends. And that fourth branch is a shared desire for success. Friends don't undermine your efforts. On the contrary, friends want to see each other achieve their true desires of their hearts to help them achieve their goals in, their, in life. Friends encourage, they challenge, they guide, but they'll critique us, but they'll celebrate with us and will supplement each other. And each of these four qualities should be part of a healthy, close relationship with a, a friend in which each friend has earned the preserved trust of the other. Unfortunately, there are some rare cases where even selflessness and dedication and loyalty and support will be twisted to cause more harm than good. We may run into that. The Lord gets us in our teaching next week a little bit about the persecution that we might have to suffer even when we do good. To be a genuine friend to another, though, we must understand each of these four branches of the sheltering tree. What element does and does not entail? Now, as a young person, most of us wanted to be popular, to have as many friends as we could possibly have. Well, a few of us probably were. We would call these casual companions our friends, and we see this on social media today. How many friends do you have on Facebook? But how many are truly, tr truly friends? Realize that being a friend in an intimate sense, a close sense, is not the same as being having a thousand Facebook friends. We should be liberal in our kindness and mercy to everyone. Everyone we meet, we should show kindness and mercy to. However, genuine friendship, that deep, intimate friendship is costly. Therefore, we need to choose our close friends wisely. We do not have an inexhaustible resource of sacrifice. We're all limited both in time and resources, emotionally and otherwise, that we can pour into our friends and support their lives and endeavors. And that's who the Lord called us to be close with. But we should never forsake our love and, and companionship and mercy to everyone we meet. We cannot maintain a confidence, intimate confidence with an infinite number of friends. So it's understandable that our list of genuine friends are manageably short. While we choose to enjoy the camaraderie with many, many more, they should see us as, yes, he's my friend or she's my friend. So there's a two separate types of friends there. But as friends, we show mercy and love one for another at all times. In our passage today, we see Jesus' teaching through these four branches of friendship. These four branches that are contained within the bookends of chapter, or verse 12 and verse 17. Verse 12, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. And the other bookend is, in verse 17, this is my command. Love each other. We're to love everyone. But those close friendships that we have are the ones where we focus our time and our energy and our resources, we pour ourselves into them to draw them close, to make them everything that God has destined them to become. And that is the passage for today. Next Sunday, Jesus continues his lesson with his disciples and with us and teaches us that even though we're to love everyone, we will have persecution in our lives. We will have hardships in our lives. 
But that's why our love for each other is so important. Next week's message is the promise of persecution. So I'd encourage you to read John chapter 15, verse 18, through chapter 16, verse 4, in preparation for next week's message. Let us pray. Father, thank you that we can call you a friend. Thank you that because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us, that he became friends, that we became adopted into your family as siblings of Jesus Christ, but more importantly, as close friends of his through the salvation that we have, that we can now have a relationship with you as Christ had a relationship with you. And when we do so, our mind will become like yours. Our prayers will become focused on you, Father, and what you have for our lives. As we bring our prayer request to you on each day, help us to have a mind of Christ that we might know your will for our lives. And as we approach friends and mingle among our friends, may we love each one as Christ loved us. And as those few that you bring into our lives who are our very close and intimate friends, may we pour ourselves into them, willing to sacrifice our own lives as Christ sacrificed his life for us, Father. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's Word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend, as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.